How is Russia's economy performing under Western sanctions? The US, EU and their allies imposed unprecedented measures as punishment for invading Ukraine. But Moscow says the country is weathering the storm. So what's the real picture? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahal Barra. Western nations imposed some of their strongest ever sanctions on Russia as punishment for invading Ukraine. They include freezing the central bank's foreign reserves, banning oil and gas imports, and suspending Russia's banks from global financial systems. The measures were meant to cripple its economy. But the Russian ruble is trading a two-year high against the US dollar. Researchers in Finland found revenues from energy sales to the EU have nearly doubled since February, when the war began. And the American investment bank, JP Morgan, says Russia's economy is performing better than expected. Still, the International Monetary Fund expects the economy to shrink by 8.5% this year. Russia's ability to limit the initial shock of sanctions has frustrated Western leaders. So how has it weathered the storm? Russia doubled interest rates to 20% when sanctions hit to help increase demand for the ruble. Capital controls were imposed. Businesses had to convert 80% of foreign currency revenues to rubles. Remittances abroad were strictly limited. Most significantly, Russia has had a steady flow of foreign currency from its vast oil and gas exports. A jump in global prices offsets some of its losses in export and production. All that has seen the ruble not only recover, but achieve a higher value than before the sanctions. Russia's president says Europe is committing economic suicide with its sanctions. The rejection of Russian energy resources means that systematically, in a long-term perspective, Europe will become the region with the highest cost of energy resources in the world. And now, frankly speaking, as the result of the chaotic actions of our partners, in addition to the damage to the European economy itself, we are actually having an increase in the revenue of the Russian oil and gas sector. And McDonald's is the latest Western company to pull out of Russia. One of the world's most recognizable symbols of capitalism opened its first restaurant 32 years ago as the Soviet Union collapsed. It's now selling all its outlets to a local business. Let's bring in our guests from Moscow, Vyacheslav Mishenko, an energy markets and oil gas expert. In Tashkent, Chris Weaver, Chief Executive Officer at the Consultancy Macro Advisory, and in Paris, Eric Shani, an economic advisor to Institute Montaigne, a think tank dedicated to public policy in France and Europe. Vyacheslav, how do you explain Russia's resilient economy despite the string of unprecedented Western sanctions? Yeah, as you mentioned in your coverage, actually, it's better, much better than expected. So I, I would like to stress that Russian oil and gas still flow uh, abroad. So still, despite all the conversations about the implementing some strong measures and uh, halting, stopping uh, the exports actually goes. And despite the fact the dependence on uh, Russian gas supply in Europe is very high. So it's over. So Russian market share in Europe is over 30 percent and even now just about 40 percent in some countries uh, like central eastern europe it's more than 80 percent dependence it's a gas balance covered by russian gas so it means that it's not easy actually to break um, on uh, just stop flowing and stop buying and stop having some trading relationship so and, and despite the fact all this pressure mm -hmm. all this political um, uh, you know just political uh, dispute, it gives, uh, you know, more uh, the, to the market. It's it's very nervous about the, uh, you know, stopping and about the uh, okay. just, you know, not having Russian supply. 
and it, it pressures on this on the prices and prices give uh, very high profit to Russian oil export and gas export companies. Chris, the economists were somehow earlier predicting the GDP of Russia to contract by 15 percent. That does not seem to be the case now. Is it because of exactly as Vyacheslav was saying, the high revenues when it comes to oil and gas exports that helped cushion against uh, a collapse of the economy? Uh, yeah, in a nutshell, that, <clears throat> that is the reason. You have to look at the Russia story in two parts. There's the financial side and there's the economic side. So as like I've said, the financial side has remained very strong because uh, we see continuing high prices for, for commodities, oil and gas, and Russia is continuing to export almost at maximum at this stage. Uh, the sanctions have not yet slowed it down. So in the first four months of this year, the country ran a trade surplus of $107 billion, a current account surplus of close to $100 billion. And, and that money, of course, is all coming back to, uh, to Russia. But on the economic side, we can see deterioration. Uh, the economy ministry, the finance ministry are all warning that there will be a big downturn in the economy uh, in now in Q2, and, and particularly they believe the worst will come in Q3. Uh, we already hear from companies that they are running short of components, uh, they can't import uh, products, so companies are starting to warn about short-term working, uh, if, if not even having to close, shut down. So we will see a rise in unemployment. Uh, we have seen a drop in, in incomes, uh, and that's affecting consumption. So we are still seeing this deterioration in the economy, uh, even though the balance sheet, if you like, is very strong. But, uh, but right now, it looks like the deterioration is going to be significantly mm -hmm. less than had been feared. The economy ministry this week said they expect GDP to contract this year by only about 7.5 to 8 percent, not 15. Mm -hmm. And that's because the government can afford to continue paying for subsidies. Eric, the central bank, since the start of the crisis, man managed somehow to fend off an economic collapse by increasing the interest rate, limiting the, uh, the, the remittances. Can it continue doing that if the sanctions continue for a longer period? You're right. The decisions taken by Elvira Nabulina, the head of the Russian Central Bank, and she's very good in her job, uh, was a very tough decision to raise interest rates to 20%. But I think the, the, the goal of this uh, tough decision was to help to keep the currency afloat. You might remember that uh, the rubble uh, in the first stage went down quite sharply. And that's why the central bank raised a rate to 20%. But of course, uh, there will be huge consequences for the economy. Uh, the Russian economy is sensitive to interest rates and to inflation as far as incomes are concerned. And uh, it seems that for Russian companies that cannot borrow from abroad because they are excluded, totally excluded from the Western financial system at least, uh, they can find a lot of uh, of money from the central bank, but at 20%, given they are indebted at variable rates, there will be casualties on the corporate side. Mm -hmm. So this monetary policy was, I think, quite smart. And it has helped, that was not the only element, it has helped to keep the rubble where it is, mm -hmm. which is a great success. And I don't think that was expected, but the consequences for the real economy are deeply negative because you cannot have a, your cake and eat it. Vyacheslav, the, the Russians had the, the, their own assets abroad. They could tap into those assets to pay for, uh, for, 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 for debt. Now, the, um, the U.S. Treasury is saying that it will not allow the Russians by the end of this month to further use the financial system to pay uh, for the debt. What is likely to mean for the Russian economy? And actually, it's called technical default, uh, but it doesn't mean that Russia and Russian authorities, I mean, financial authority can't pay. They can pay and they're ready to pay. But, you know, this is uh, in the political uh, actually angle. From the political angle, this is kind of dispute, but uh, technically it's possible. But, you know, it depends on, on the positions of the parties. I would like to stress again, I would like to add that uh, so the Russian market, 
as in general, the, yeah, I, I agree. I would agree with the, with a colleague of mine that uh, there is a uh, implement implementation of a financial plan. It goes well, but the economical, you know, side probably we will see some decrease of the economy, as you mentioned, but not to the eight percent. It's up to the five percent, which is the latest calculation actually for the year. But again, the revenues are huge, and revenues are very strong from the export activities. It's not. It's not only oil. It's just all the raw materials and you know the 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 markets actually Russia exports and by the way Russia is seeking for the new markets and the the you know interesting information that India has become the number one uh, buyer of Russian crude for the last two months so it's actually tripled even just for the short period of time the the uh, the purchase of Russian uh, uh, materials actually especially oil. Mm -hmm. That's a very significant uh, deal, actually, for Russia finding new markets. Chris, the European market has always been crucial for the Russian economy. But what happens next when the Europeans decide it's about time to finally turn their back on the Russian gas and oil? Okay, first of all, for sure, it'll be, it'll be damaging, but it's important to bear in mind that Russia has been dealing with sanctions since 2014. And, and back in 2014, Europe was concerned about dependency on Russian energy imports, but Moscow also started to get concerned about the fact that it was, it was also very dependent on Europe as the buyer of its energy. And actually, over the last eight years, Russia has made uh, a lot of progress uh, uh, much more than Europe, in diversifying its uh, customer base. So, for example, right now, uh, it, uh, China is the biggest trade partner of Russia, whereas pre-2014, it was Germany. Uh, so, therefore, the, the system, to some extent, has been diversified. Russia mm -hmm. is no longer as vulnerable to Europe as it used to be. Uh, and as a previous speaker said, uh, Russia has now been very proactive, even in the last few months, in, uh, in looking for, for new markets. Uh, India, as you mentioned, is certainly one that has emerged strongly as a, as a potential buyer. And even if Russia is offering its oil and gas at a discount, bearing in mind that prices are now significantly higher than they have been over the last few years, this is why Russia is now earning a significant amount of money, a trade surplus of $107 billion, say, in the first four months of this year. And, we, and it's running at about 25 to $30 billion a month right now. That gives Russia mm -hmm. a significant amount of financial resources to subsidize the economy and to start, uh, if you like, readjusting the economy for, for long-term sanctions if it needs to. Eric, is Europe ready for the day when they will phase out Russian energy and su supplies? Or is it just an issue of political leverage they are using now and they seem to be not really genuine about severing economic ties with Russia? Well, I, I do think that it's uh, more a question of when than a question of if. I think the, the political shock in Western Europe, but especially in Germany, because the, the whole energy policy of Germany is based on uh, Russian gas, if you want. It's not only for uh, the production of electricity, it's also for the German industry, which says it's thanks to the Russian gas that we are competitive. That was true. And now everybody has understood that Russia is not a reliable supplier of uh, hydrocarbons, of fossil fuels. The Soviet Union was reliable, Russia is not. When uh, Mr. Putin decides to cut supply, uh, he cuts supply. So I think it's going to happen, but slowly, because Germany made enormous mistakes in its own energy policy by putting its eggs, all its eggs in the Russian uh, pipelines, uh, if you want. But the decision, the political decision is taken and there is no way I think Europe will shy away from cutting all imports of energy from Russia. Ideally, that should be done immediately and that is possible. Uh, but there is a very strong political resistance from the German industry and from uh, the German socialists to do that. Mm -hmm. So that will take time. Okay. But I think in one year time, Europe will have cut its supplies from Russia 
will have started to diversify its supplies from other gas suppliers. As far as oil is concerned, it's not a problem because oil is a global market. Gas is much more complicated. And a lot of countries in Europe have decided to relaunch uh, their nuclear plants, with, with uh, the exception of Germany, of course. So for all these reasons, I think that Europe will be able to get rid of Russian supplies. I see your point. It's going to take more. Vyacheslav, when you yes. look at the economy now and you see the indicators, prices are soaring, inflation is likely to hit 20%, unemployment is on the rise. Could this be the real indication that there is something wrong with the economy now in Russia? You know, the things are mo have, been, have been moving so fast. We can't rely on this, you know, just just the current numbers, actually. Let me just argue one, one thing I would mm -hmm. like to say about a reliable uh, supplier. Actually, we, we shouldn't lose the, the, the chain, the logic chain, actually. So nobody cuts supplies, actually. So the, the Russian state reserves, financial reserves, were frozen and seized, actually. And then it has become very... Uh, hard actually to supply the commodities actually to European markets in in the currency in euro and in dollars actually that the scheme was actually offered to the European buyers actually to put the euros on the special accounts and to convert them into rubles. That's the core issue actually. Nobody stopped and nobody cut the supply actually. So it still goes there. So I mean uh, back to the numbers. I think. We will see some recovering, um, even now with whether just you know, just the prices, just you know, uh, just in regular you know the Russian stores and food stores and everything are going better. So they're going back uh, from the shock they used to have in, in the end of February and, and then beginning of March. So it was a kind of uh, emotional reaction uh, to the events and you know to the uh, political situation. But now it's back to normal, and the ruble is strong, just not because the regulation, but because of the huge, I know, disproportional you know, of, of uh, trade balance, because Russia exports much more than inputs mm -hmm. now because of the restrictions. And that pushes ruble to the level we see since um, 2018, probably. All right. Um, Chris, since you have started your conversation with us, uh, saying that it's about time to look at the financial aspect from one, on one hand and the economy on the other hand, when you see the economy with experts saying that you're likely to see 2 million Russians lose their job this year, this year. Couldn't this be the indication that there's going to be a serious structural problem with the Russian economy from now onwards? Oh, I think there's no doubt <clears throat> the economy is facing structural change. It's uh, clearly there are there are so many scenarios you could talk about uh, whether you want to be optimistic or pessimistic. A lot of which will depend on what happens to commodity prices and therefore the government's uh, cash flow. What happens with sanctions? What happens uh, basically on so many aspects which will have, have have an input. But the fact that there will be a structural change in the economy is without doubt. Uh, Russia is going to have to become a lot more diversified uh, in its trade and sourcing of materials. It's going to have to find ways to create new, new areas of employment in the future. And, and that transition is going to be painful. How painful will depend on how much money the government has in the budget to provide subsidies uh, and, and to pay for, for this. And that then critically, of course, is linked to uh, how much commodities that exports and what the price of those commodities will be. So it's too early to say yet as to whether or not there's going mm -hmm. to be 2 million people unemployed or 1 million. Uh, we do note that the government is very, very focused on job preservation. We saw this week, for example, the announcement from Renault that it is selling its business to a local buyer and McDonald's, which employs 62,000 people in Russia, has also sold to a, a local buyer. And we know that the government is providing subsidies is involved in these transactions because it is, it is absolutely focused on job preservations. And, and as we started a conversation to say they can afford to do that mm -hmm. in the current situation, the question is how long will that cash flow remain sufficiently large that they will be able to cushion the economy from the more pessimistic scenarios? That's an enormous question mark. Eric, the West started the sanctions to send a clear political message to the Russian government that 
they will not tolerate what is happening in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. But the sanctions themselves are triggering a global economic crisis with the soaring prices, particularly when it comes to food and energy. Could this backfire in a way or another, raising international discontent over what is happening? Well, that's a very important question, but I, I would put it slightly differently. Um, it's not only the sanctions. That's, the sanctions are, are having a deep impact on the Russian economy. They also have an impact on energy prices, as you said. Uh, but the fact, for instance, that food prices are rising are absolutely not linked to sanctions. They are caused by the fact that the Russian Navy is blocking Ukrainian exports of wheat. Mm -hmm. So it's the war decided by Russia that is causing this soaring uh, energy and food prices. And I'm afraid that as far as food prices are concerned, the consequences might be very dire for a lot of countries. Uh, think of Egypt, for instance, where the population is really already on very low incomes and uh, very, very quick to go to social and political unrest. So we are going to see a lot of consequences. Could that backfire on the sanctions themselves? I don't think so. There is a huge debate in Germany again about what would happen if Germany cut its uh, supplies of uh, natural gas from Russia. So that will be done progressively. Uh, and I think that we are going to have a recession mm -hmm. due to uh, this, this big shock. There is less energy and food supply but there are also higher prices. So when you put that together, that is one of the reasons of stagflation. Mm -hmm. Okay, but this is going to prove temporary. And that's why I don't think it will lead to, uh, you know, second thoughts about the sanctions. Okay. I would even go so far as saying that the sanctions so far have been relatively light. Gazprom Bank is not sanctioned. Sberbank Bank is not sanctioned. So Germany has obtained that... Uh, it would still be possible for Russia to export All its right. oil and gas in Europe. Vyacheslav, so we are going to have more sanctions, not less. Okay, Vyacheslav, very briefly, if you don't mind. Now, Russia has been working for quite some time on two key assets. One, reasserting itself as a trusted supplier of energy. Two, a key player in the global market. On the two aspects, it, is suffering now because it's now being more and more isolated from the global financial market. And number two, it's not really widely seen, particularly in Europe, as someone we can trust when it comes to the supply of gas and energy. Could this be the main setback facing the Russian economy in the future? Um, I don't think so. I think we are on the edge of, of, of uh, global changing, uh, and changing the markets, uh, actually, the, the scheme of the markets. and. Uh, so I, I mean, Russian commodities and Russian exports will be will be looking for for the new markets and for the for the markets with it. So it's it's not a secret that the the key demand is being formed in the South East Asia and the countries like Africa, as you mentioned, and not only on the energy but on the food as well. So you, uh, my colleague just mentioned wheat. Yes, there will be some some troubles actually exporting wheat. And actually, Russia implemented some some export ban uh, for for some for some period of time because Russia is the largest and uh, exporter of, of wheat in the world. So I mean, but still, so demand is there, and the population of global population is is, is growing. So I mean, uh, so despite the financial troubles and the uh, sanctions, I think sanctions is uh, is a dead end. So they did at, at the end of the day. They actually uh, harm all the global trade and, and, and relationship. I mean, economical. Thank you. Uh, on from the economical side, it's it's not just the solution. Actually, I think they will be finding new ways and new platform, like like uh, you know, just new. Thank uh, you. Uh, new technologies actually will be supporting the the, the exports and Gentlemen. not the financial schemes. Gentlemen, we have to leave it there. Yashislav Mishenko, Chris Wifa, Eric Shani. I really appreciate your insight. Thank you. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story from Yahasha Mahalbala and the entire team here in Doha. Bye for now.